Hello, I'm Carolyn Assom. I'm a fashion and design journalist. Until a few years ago, I was fashion editor at the Times newspaper. More recently, I have written about sustainable fashion and now advise fashion brands on the urgent need to radically overhaul the impact our wardrobes are having on the planet. Today, I'm very excited to be talking about some of the solutions that are on offer and also how we can make the sort of change, the sort of meaningful change that is required to reduce the fashion industry's impact on the environment. So joining me is a panel of passionate and committed change makers who love fashion, but want their love of fashion to not cost the earth. So welcome to Jasmine Hensley, who is a wellness expert and an author and a presenter. Thank you. And um, Beth Pettit, who is head of category fashion brands at John Lewis. Then we have Charlotte Morley, who is founder and CEO of the children's um, fashion rental platform, The Little Loop and Victoria Prue, who is co-founder and CEO of the fashion marketplace, Her. So welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being here, for joining me. Um, we're going to get started. It's no secret that the fashion industry and fashion has got a huge job, really, role to play in reducing global emissions. The industry accounts for as much as 8 to 10 percent of annual global emissions, which is quite terrifying, I think. And clothing production has doubled, but sadly, the length of time we wear any of these clothes has fallen by more than a third. Add to this the flood of online brands who produce dresses for £10, bikinis for £1, and we've adopted this culture where clothes are so easy to just discard and get rid of. Um, but there is a real environmental cost to all of this because clothes are so um, inexpensive and low quality, people tend to buy new rather than repair them, mend them. And we're, what we're seeing is we're he seeing mountains of discarded clothing that's often getting burnt, ending in landfill. And if you take into account the resources that are needed to make all those clothes as well, it just, I mean, it just all amounts to a colossal waste. So in short, our wardrobes have become these unsustainable beasts that sort of we have to you know, kind of keep feeding. Is fast fashion entirely to blame for this? How do we address the insatious and constant need for like new, 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 new? Um, I'm going to come to you first, Victoria. Is the answer to fast fashion, fashion rental? So first and foremost, fashion exists because it should be fun and we never want to take away that dopamine hit of when you unbox something and it feels new to you. I think this is all around how we change what newness is. So I think fashion rental is a great solution. Obviously, we're quite biased, um, it, it, but it's part of the solution. It's not the singular solution. The solution to how we change is all around redefining ownership. And that is the circular economy in its entirety. So what we need to do is take the fashion industry, which as at today's date, you know, majority operates on a linear model where we're buying something, wearing it once and chucking it away, that absolutely has to stop. And what we need is a more circular model of fashion where rental, resale, repair, as you mentioned, is all part of the solution. Okay, thank you. Hold on. I think to add to what Victoria said, the other thing that we need to encourage consumers to do more of is to understand not just the environmental impact of the waste that we're producing, but also the social impact of those cheap clothes being produced and try to get consumers to understand the true cost of actually what they own and, or don't own, what they borrow, um, so that they can, I think, to try and educate them in a way to stop them consuming things which ultimately are unsustainable from an environmental and societal perspective. So enabling them to access more ethically produced clothing or sustainably produced clothing more affordably is another mm. thing which the circular economy enables. Um, and it's a whole layer that I think a lot of people don't understand, but once you start to think mm more about what you're actually consuming, not just how much you're consuming, but what it is. I think that's actually got a lot of potential as well to kind of shift the tide away from fast fashion. Okay, thank you. Beth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's multifaceted, um, but I think rental absolutely is part of the solution. And, you know, 
for uh, a retailer like John Lewis, where we have a large access to a huge customer database, we're really excited to be part of making rental accessible through Little Loop, through our partnership with her. Um, so we absolutely think it should be at the forefront of our strategy. Um, I think rental is absolutely part of it. I th the other thing I think is important is that as retailers, um, when it comes to our own label product as well, that we're doing that and making that and designing that responsibly. And the two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we haven't necessarily entered fast fashion at John Lewis. You know, our own label product is fairly timeless, mm -hmm. um, fairly versatile. And I think that paired with some real excitement through, um, you know, some of the brands that we're be being able to bring to the customer through rental is a brilliant combination to start getting the customer to think and change their mindset. Because exactly, it's exactly that. I think customers have got so used to, be buy to buying clothes at such you know, ridiculously low prices, and now with the looming cost of living crisis, how do you make the case for um, sustainable clothes, which, you know, most often do cost more? Yeah, so I, I think we have to accept that customers want to buy clothes that do good, um, but they don't necessarily want to pay more for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's understandable. So there is a responsibility for us to make sure that what we're producing is sustainable, not as an add-on, but it, it mm -hmm. kind of has to be at the start of the process. Exactly. And, and frankly, that's the only way that we'll keep costs down as well, mm -hmm. is if we build it into everything we do. Into your model. Um, exactly, and, and, and that is where we are. Is a, there's a terrific amount of work involved, you know, because it is a, it's a whole sea change for the industry. Um, it's hard, but that's the answer, and we can't expect consumers to be paying the tax for that. Sure. Okay. Um, Victoria. So in terms of kind of cost of living and, uh, and inflation and everything that's going into at a time as we launch John Lewis Rental, uh, the value proposition of rental becomes even more significant when we're mm -hmm. entering the kind of environment that we're in. So when you're choosing to invest in uh, buying a dress for £400 or say renting an amazing Lyrica mm -hmm. Matoshi dress uh, as perfectly <laughs> modelled, um, that is a, a, an example of an item that you might only want in your wardrobe for four, eight, ten or twenty days. And how amazing that we can act access incredible pieces for really a fraction of the price. So at Her, we have always said, we're never gonna stop people trying to buy. What we want to do is share the vision and the mission that we want people to invest in quality over quantity. That is the key shift that needs to happen. Understand that pieces need to stand the test of time. They need to work season after season. And then you really should be able to rent the rest. You should be able to rent any of the amazing dresses behind us um, and, and lots of other parts of your wardrobe too. Charlotte, do you have anything to add? Well, only that I think I think consumers do assume that sustainability costs more. I think it's it's unfortunately still very much ingrained in us that to do something sustainably is going to cost more and it's going to be more inconvenient. It's going mm -hmm. to be harder work. It's yeah. and actually, a hassle. It's yeah, absolutely. And I think that is really where rental plays its part because rental enables either whether it be higher end pieces or the way we're doing it, which is really access to pretty much everyday clothing. Mm. But because they're ethically produced and sustainably produced, they're slightly more expensive. Well, relatively more expensive than the high street. But if you rent it, you can access it for less money than the high street. So we're giving people a way to be sustainable with less money and less hassle because the way we're trying very hard to build our platforms is to make it very seamless and straightforward for people to use. Um, we have had a customer recently say, when I started doing this, I thought there must be a catch. Mm. <laughs> and, th and there isn't. There isn't yeah, a catch. I think and, and, and I think that's quite hard for people to get. No. Yeah. But we're going to come to that later because it's changing that mindset, yeah. actually, that you can do that with mm -hmm. that, you know, it being this huge effort. Um, so moving on now. When we talk about reducing fashion's impact on the planet, the change needs to be quite radical. You know, we talk about it a lot, but it really does need to be quite radical because the industry will really need to invent, reinvent itself entirely to sort of hit, hit the goals that we need to, to, to hit, to reduce its carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. So clearly we need more than a sort of one size fits all approach to all of this. And, and, and there are so many things that we can do, which I hope, you know, we're going to talk about today, you know, from um, circularity bridge design, repair. Um, I was interviewing um, a head of uh, um, sustainability um, at a luxury brand, and obviously every brand has a profit and loss account. And he was saying that they're implementing a sort of environmental profit, profit and wow. loss sheet, mm -hmm. which just sort of makes sense because you can really track the progress that yeah. way. Beth, what is the answer to sort of all the different things that we can do? Because it is, it is yeah. many different things. Yeah, um, I think, you know, there's, 
it's for us, I guess I, I, I look at it from the perspective of a, of a retailer first and foremost, as well as a customer. And I think, you know, we've got a responsibility to do, I guess, what you've just described, mm -hmm. which is make sure that we, we budget and cost for doing things differently. And that is a decision that, you know, we've, we've taken as a business, mm -hmm. as a board to put um, doing business in a better way front and centre of our, of our agenda. Um, and, and really kind of acting with purpose. When we first introduced this, you know, we've, we've been at this for a while, but when we first really started thinking about what's our purpose, what can we give back, how can we do things better, you know, there was a lot of hard choices that we were faced with. Um, but what was incredible was how galvanising it was for everybody mm. in our community. So, you know, the brilliant work that um, Charlotte's doing, that Victoria, the disruption, you know, that, that Victoria's putting in the market, the amazing work that Jasmine does to support it, mm. you know, these things aren't, by you know happenstance it's no. because there's a real movement out and there a passion, and there's, there's a passion want people care so collective want you know to. and and you know apart from anything you know we've got to be in tune and in step with that as mm -hmm. a retailer that you know mm -hmm. wants to to have a, a strong place within modern britain um but actually you know i, I think it's using our power mm -hmm. our consume you know our power and, as, and our platform to talk about why it's important to conceive and develop product properly why um, rental can be really exciting and fun mm -hmm. and capture all the joy of fashion and be amazing for your wallet in very tough times mm -hmm. um, and to tell the stories of amazing new and you know emerging brands that are doing this you know really really well mm -hmm. so we have a huge responsibility to talk about it we genuinely think it's important mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it feeding that narrative, um, you know, with, with a, a brand that has the reach we have, um, is, is, I hope, going to make a change. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Um, Jasmine. Mm -hmm. I think rental is so brilliant because to make your own clothes, to mend and repair, mm -hmm. these are skills that are just not being taught in schools anymore. Um, so that's something that the consumer has to do then to we need to change that yeah we do need to change that we absolutely need to change that is you know that's a, that to me is a life skill mm. as is cooking managing your finances taking care of your health in your home and it's not being taught you know academic subjects have kind of overridden that and it's a I'm real shame I know totally you know I you know I, I, I think I cross stitched a bookmark and I made some Bermuda shorts at school mm. and that's all I did but at least I did something yes, you know, and yeah. I have a bit of an idea I can do buttons I can um, you know wonderfully for us now things like you know youtube you can see how to fix a zip mm. you know and there are many ways that zip goes wrong and for most of us that means all the, the garment gets tossed out mm. or we pray to god that there's someone on the high street that still fixes these things um but when it costs 10 pounds to fix, fix a zip and 10 pounds to buy something you know you as a consumer are really confused about which way to go mm. then you've got also you know, greenwashing aside, trying to understand what makes a company eco and ethical is an absolute minefield. That's another job for the consumer. So it's very difficult. But with rental, you know, other than this thing we have to get over, which some people might find very taboo, the idea of wearing clothes that someone else has worn or that they're wearing something they don't own um, or even, you know, affordability or the financials of um, but I don't own it, we know sure. where is this going. Um, I think if we can keep on publicising that, you know, and, and it's... Um, and championing that. Championing yes. it, and it's a concept that's proving itself, you know, there will be more innovation, maybe we don't know what that looks like now, no, but sure. more innovation to make that more in inclusive to, peop to people. And we can change the mindsets maybe of people who can't afford to rent a weekly wardrobe, a monthly wardrobe, you know, but when it comes to weddings and special occasions, or they just need to actually, they feel like they need an overhaul in their whole look, you know, maybe they've had some hard times, um, uh, you know, a divorcee or a new mom or, or a new job, um, then you want to be able to experiment and have that fun of fashion. Um, and this is that what joy. we need to be saying that yes. the rental can give you. Yeah. Um, and then if you are working in a, in a field where, you know, the content you put out you know you don't want to look like you're repeating stuff then we also have this rental and the rental just just fills so many of those gaps you get the buzz you get the dopamine high um but you don't have to own it and that's a, a, a kind of a weird concept for people to get their heads around and it's also not just sitting there you know as a as a purchase that we kind of regret but we spent a lot of money so we're holding on to it and, and guilty yeah and it's a chance to actually um continually reassess and reflect on 
do I even like wearing stuff mm -hmm. like that? Or who am I wearing that for? Or is that practical? Mm -hmm. Or I don't, I actually get indigestion when I wear a tight top. You know, mm -hmm. just these little things rather than going, oh, you know what? I, I've, I've made it, I've got to make it work kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, rental is a, is a brilliant thing that covers all of these aspects for the consumer. I mean, you must have found that, Victoria, from the people that you, uh, the customers that you rent to. Yeah, absolutely. We call it the aha moment at her, which is when we take our customer on their first ever rental. I'm sure you have the same when, when someone says like, where, where is the, the trick? This is mm. too good to be true. And, and that's what you want. Um, and I often come back to the idea that 10 years ago, we had never rented someone else's house, like the biggest sharing mm. economy platforms in the world, like Airbnb and Uber mm. have done. So 10 years ago, when that was a bit of a weird concept and everyone thought, is that safe? How does it work? Um, is that something I'm, I'm going to do? Now, 10 years on, you might look at an Airbnb before you looked at a traditional hotel. We've had the same shift happen in uh, cars like Uber uh, too. So the sharing economy and how we how we have that mindset shift, it's happening in fashion mm. now and, and at huge scale pretty quickly. Um, and I think the second thing is that we, we have learned as a, as a small startup, the power of a loud voice, because what we don't want is a few people renting. We want mm -hmm. you know millions of people, people hundreds renting. of millions mm -hmm. of people all trying to use resale platforms more, use rental platforms more, sew up that zip that's broken. What we need is everyone actively trying to be a bit better rather than a few people doing it extremely well. And I think that's where partnerships come in so mm -hmm. strongly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we all act kind of in parallel to the industry and, mm -hmm. and we as small startups try to act on our own and do this, it's never going to go anywhere. We just couldn't afford the marketing budget, if anything mm -hmm. else. Um, we, the, part, the partnerships that we forge with brands like John Lewis are absolutely integral to making this work. And, and circular economy is all about partnerships. That's the only way the circular economy can possibly work. What happens to clothing after it reaches the end of its life? Uh, well, our clothing yes. is recycled. Yeah. So um, we actually have something quite unique on the Little Loop, which works for children's clothing. I think we introduced it specifically for children's clothing, which is our condition levels. So rather than just renting an item, not knowing what condition you're going to get it in, we, we, we call out very explicitly to the consumer, you're going to get this brand new or gently worn or what we call well loved. Um, and they get to choose that. So they pay slightly more if they want it brand new, etc. cetera. Um, and that means that we can actually keep our clothes in circulation for that bit longer because we can call out that it's well loved. It might have a small stain or, or, or be a bit more faded or bobbled, but people actually love that because particularly with children, if you can rent something that you know is already a little bit faded, you're not going to be so stressed about it. <laughs> and of course, we don't want our consumers to be worried about wearing, our customers to be uh, worried about wearing any of the clothes that, they, that sure. they borrow, but some people would just prefer to rent something that a little bit older for certain things. But then, of course, everything comes to the end of its life. Um, so we actually have, um, we resell things. So we have, if things are in great condition but we don't want to rent them anymore, then we can resell them so that consumers can own them or we recycle them. And anything that we have sold, we'll also take back to recycle. Um, and we recycle it here in the UK. So it's fully recycled back into fabrics. It's not the stick it in the clothing box, hope that it's going to go somewhere and actually it's getting shipped to a, another country and, and, you know, and, and becomes someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's important. I think the biggest challenge though really is, is just changing the mindset. We touched upon this earlier. So how do we change the mindsets? You know, how do we go about doing that? How do we make sure that every stitch, every thread, every garment that we make you know, has, has really been thought through and that we're not just exhausting natural resources of which there are you know there are then you know they're not infinite are they yeah. there's an organic shift happening mm -hmm. um which is great so i think three years ago when i first started the business and started talking to people about it this concept of ownership and, and it's still there but the concept of ownership is so ingrained in the british psyche mm. good old-fashioned british ownership we own our houses we own our cars and, and that's just about, that's kind of partly who we are, but organically as new generations are coming through and they're seeing what's happening to the planet, that is starting to shift. And you know, I think part of it's probably been helped by the fact that people can't afford to own their own homes anymore. Mm -hmm. So younger generations are already starting to break those relationships. So there's the, there is an organic shift, but I think we also need to help it on its journey. And, and something that we try to do is storytelling. So I think there's trying to shift people's the way people conceptualize value so it's not just uh, it's valuable because I own it but it's valuable because this actual product has got a story to it mm -hmm. so it's trying helping people to understand the story of the person that grew the cotton mm -hmm. that turned it into clothing in the first place and the stories of all the people who've worn Who it involved yeah. so and, and as and as brands I think that's something that's really exciting that we can start to try to bring those stories out and as we become more mature and we get better technology and you know we we put QR codes into our clothes and the ambition with that is 
is that we can start to build up this picture of who has had the clothes because there's a, a whole new value there. Um, and, and, and it's very new and we're trying our hardest to kind of make that work, but we're seeing that that's starting to go down well and rental builds communities. Mm -hmm. and that's the massive benefit we have. We have this conversation with our customers that the traditional transactional business doesn't have. Um, so there's huge opportunity and it's really exciting actually. Community, you know yeah. all about that. It's absolutely key for us at her. Um, a lot of our new customers that we get every day, every week and every month come through what we call viral word of mouth. So the idea is that Victoria has rented a dress and we find that our customers are very vocal about the fact that they have rented a dress rather than buying something new for a wear at once occasion like weddings um, or, or a party that they might be having. And then they'll go to that wedding, tell 50 of their friends that they rented it for a fraction of the, of the retail price. Um, and they're really, really proud to shout about that, which is something that I thought perhaps being British or a UK led startup, um, people would be a bit more reluctant to. And we found the absolute opposite. So community for us is absolutely key. I love hearing the stories about our customers doing all the amazing things they get up to in rental. Um, we have a big uh, cohort of customers that love renting for like job interviews and feeling powerful and kind of going away from just dresses, which is definitely our bread and butter, but into really powerful tailoring, which is a big category for us into ski wear because actually how amazing yes, that you can great. rent a, you know a, a new season you know, ski suit or, or, or jacket for four eight or, or, or ten days so community is absolutely the beating heart of, of, of her as it is I'm sure for you too um, and yeah we have a, a lot of thanks to our to our community for getting us to where we are today and so with changing this consumer mindset how do you how do you deal with that John Lewis um, I think it's really important that we try to make this easy and convenient mm -hmm. for the customer. So um, we've spoken obviously about how rental can do that. You know, our um, mission, if you like, is to be there for all life's moments at John Lewis. And you've just picked out a few actually, Victoria. So, you know, how can we be part of celebrating life moments and catering for them mm. in a way that doesn't cost you much money and is, you know, much more easy to come by. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, it's, it's having a responsibility to make sure that we do deal with clothes at the end of their life. Now, this is vast because we have huge customer numbers and I guess that's particular to every customer, I guess, mm. you know, what you do with your product at, when you've decided you don't want to start wearing it. Um, it's one of the reasons we introduced our fashion cycle scheme. So that's recently introduced this year, um, which is points in all of our stores where you can bring back old clothing mm -hmm. and get a voucher, five pounds, mm -hmm. and then that goes towards a new purchase. So I guess seeding the mentality of reward for, you know, for, 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 um, for doing something better um, with older clothing or clothing you just don't want to wear anymore. And same with Beauty Cycle, actually, we did it on our beauty products. Um, and already, we've, I think we've had 425,000 units of beauty packaging that's avoided mm -hmm. landfill as a result of it. So, you know, small changes, but, mm. but mounting up to big differences. Mm. Um, and that's so key, I think. Yeah. All because those little like, changes. You're bringing the consumer into um, being part of the story of the along with the brand mm. and, um, and all the retailer. And I think, you know, from when I was growing up, you know, when my mum bought my clothes, my parents bought my clothes, or when I had my first paycheck, clothes weren't as cheap, the fast fashion mm. hadn't quite begun. Mm. And so... Um, you took care of it. You place. took care of it. You, you know, um, altered them yourself or did something kooky mm. with them when you, they needed a fresh look. And I remember we had this Vogue book of um, how to uh, change your 60s items into something a bit more 70s by cutting it <laughs> off here and doing that. Right. And I was, I was fascinated by it. Um, and, you know, with rental now, it's Aww. like having, you know, uh, sharing your friend's wardrobe. Sure. But your friend's got a massive wardrobe. Mm -hmm. So it's even more exciting. More exciting. Yeah, because at the moment, we don't have time. We consume at such a pace that we don't have time to be involved with the product and like the history and the, the story behind it and things. So therefore, we don't have feelings or emotions mm -hmm. attached to it. So it's and when we do, it's a bit icky. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of people, every that time line. we talk about yeah, planet sustainable, you know, planet friendly solutions, it brings up a bit of ick in us. Mm -hmm. And then when we talk about the cost, you know, when we look at our wardrobe, you know, this cost of living crisis almost gives us an opportunity to, you know, really slow down a bit and reflect and go, okay, so my, you know, I've got to really slash my budget on, on some of my fancy outgoings. If I look at my wardrobe in the last couple of years, how many of those things do I regret buying and how many of those things am I going to want to wear in the future? Um, do you think brands, Jasmine, are doing enough to really cut through that, to get that message across? Not to brands as a whole, but mm -hmm. I think there are many 
key brands out there. Who really try. Yeah, and, and even by joining with you know John Lewis, suddenly it becomes a whole new benchmark, a whole new level of awareness sure. and education for consumers. And it also becomes more palatable. You know, John Lewis are into it. I can trust it John Lewis. Be, yes, it must exactly. be good. And now I can talk about it with my friends when maybe they would have gone, you what? You know, yes, it just yes, feels yes. like it's, um, oh, it's the thing to do now. And it feels better. And it's something I can take part of. So it's, you know, you are part of a citizenship based model rather mm -hmm. than this, um, you know, third party consumer that just, you're just a figure, you buy it, you hand your money over and then what happens? Mm -hmm. Now we are part of the story of that garment. And I think emotionally we can then under, begin to understand you know that um, our money and in the you know the drive for planet friendly more sustainable uh, practices we can start to be part of the shift together and inspire others to do the same the media has got a huge role to play in, mm. in, in changing mindsets it's it, it's hard though it's you know the nature of publication is such that they're always reporting on the new you know new trends new clothes new brands and yet, and, and also there's this really complex advertising sort of yes. <laughs> UK system. So, so they've, you know, they've got to, but I think there is definitely more articles, more features that sort of, you know, really champion by less, by better. Um, I, I know that some of the most stylish women that I've interviewed and also know, they, they actually don't have a huge wardrobe. They have a really well curated, small edited wardrobe that is, actually communicates really yeah. concisely their style yeah. and they wear and, it well and, and they wear it well and they really yeah. you know and i think and i've really learned you know learned to embrace that and i think actually that's a really great message to get across you know actually yeah. being stylish being fashionable isn't about having mm. hundreds and hundreds of clothes it's mm. just sort of knowing your style knowing what suits you and and just having that i think well i have always dreamed of being the woman who has a capsule wardrobe <laughs> and i and i also know that i am a magpie for mm. everything everything else. And, you know i'm in, inspired <laughs> by in, inspired by so many people and i want to buy into that or be sure. part of it so it's it's lovely this idea of education and awareness around the quality of, of products, mm -hmm. what makes a quality product. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the cost and it's not necessarily the brand. Um, we should know that just like we should know about taking care of our health. Mm -hmm. Again, that we talked about that for, for um, an education as part of uh, uh, school and things. I, another subject I would like to talk about is, is, is greenwashing. You know, and when I say greenwashing, what I mean is the um, extent to, to when companies deliberately mislead their consumers to making them feel that what they're selling is more eco, more, you know, sustainable. Um, and how does this impact on consumers, you know, who want to do, who want to make better choices? They want to, you know, buy more sustainably, but they don't know who to trust. No, well, they, they, it, they, they, is, that, is that a big issue for your followers? Oh, massive, because, you know, we're time poor and mm -hmm. it's, you know, also a matter of cost. And we have this mm -hmm. assumption that it also will cost more. And in general, it does. If you're trying to be eco and ethical across the board, there are so many parts. It's not just is your is your fabric natural and will it return to the earth in some oh. way, shape or form? It's how do we treat the people that work mm. within it's this brand? It's all part of the story, isn't it? It's all part of the story. Mm. So if you're a time poor person and that brand is saying, you know, has this lovely statement and we don't have time to read pages of this stuff, which there needs to be mm. really, um, we're just going to hear what we want to hear and we're going to feel good for that. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be this balance between calling it out and, mm -hmm. and, and um, educating on what some of these statements mean mm -hmm. and what they really stand for, as well as encouraging, because it is a minefield. I'm no expert. I could, I, I, you know, no. I, I've been to so many talks where someone's an expert in one area but hasn't considered the other. Mm -hmm. And then when a brand is trying to consider all of them, they can't, they they, can't, make, they, it they can't make it work. No, or they can't make it work. They don't have time and to be creative. It, and it's almost about making... I think it's sort of owning up to that and say, look, we're, you know, we've got this bit we think nailed, yeah. but we're really trying to work hard on that bit. Yeah. And I yeah. think it's just, I, I don't think, yeah. that, you know, the consumer is not expecting everything, no. but I think as long as you can be, you know, transparent. Yeah. Or, you know, work with us while we're trying to get this ma particular material mm -hmm. that you know and love for X, Y, Z right, because it hasn't worked in this new technique we tried. Sure. And again, then you're bringing that, um, the consumer in as part of it. A part and of I, the journey. And I think yeah. it's, you know, for me, fast fashion, is overconsumption, mm -hmm. it's disconnection. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know yourself, you don't mm -hmm. know the people around you because you're in this fast paced, trend led, um, futuristic kind of mindset. And when you have time to slow down and reflect um, and be part of the story, it will create a change. Mm -hmm. And like we said, mm -hmm. for people 
um, f for people, you know, for a vast number of people mm -hmm. rather than just a few select people because it does feel like a bit of a club at the moment mm -hmm. um, in that, oh, she knows what to buy or sure, they know, yeah, yeah. or they understand that stuff and, oh, they've got time and money to spend on that kind of <coughs> idea and I've just got to get to the kids, you know, or, or things like that. So it can feel very um, yes, yeah. um, separatist in, in many ways. Beth, on the question of trust and yeah. greenwashing, yes. how do we know we can trust on Lewis? Um, that's a brilliant question. <laughs> um, so, I, I, and I was nodding furiously with everything you were saying actually, because, it, because this is so complex and you can get one thing really right and another thing really mm -hmm. wrong. Um, and there is no perfect way to wrap up, you know, leaving no carbon footprint mm. on the earth for any of us. So um, to make it, I guess, to break it down simply, there's, there's two things that we focus on. That, that I think you know tell you that you can trust us and we're working hard in this space. The first is our own kind of policies and commitments. So you know this goes back to uh, we do three things when it comes to developing our own product. We have a charter around raw materials and getting back to fully raw materials by 2023. We're well on our way. Um, ethical compliance in our factory base, so we have really high targets on that. The second part of what we do then is really partnering up with people that we know can do this because we can't do it alone and it is vast um, and that is where things like our rental partnership and, and propositions really come into it our fashion cycle our beauty cycle the third part I was going to say is circular design so um, you know we've got the, and this comes back to what I said at the start so really at the start of the process building it in indeed you know and we, we, we're doing it we're not there on everything of course we're not and you know uh, and we won't claim to be but we've got some brilliant examples like cashmere where you know cashmere um, we, we are one of the market leaders in selling cashmere so what we do here can make a real difference and our sources you know have fully traceable fiber now we've worked really hard on that we've worked hard on our partnership with the sustainable fiber alliance mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's you know as I say really you know finding the partners who are experts in this field and working with them rather than trying to do it all ourselves mm -hmm. is the only way we're going to make a difference and being open and transparent mm -hmm. about that. Sure, which goes back to the community yeah. point that we were talking. What do you think customers should be asking then if they want to make those, those choices? What should they be asking when they shop from a so-called sustainable brand? What do you think? It's really hard because as Jasmine's very beautifully explained, it's incredibly complicated. Mm. Um, but I think we can distill it down to a very simple base tenant, which is if a brand is encouraging you to consume more without thinking about it and without helping you to consume it in a more, in, in a better way, way, in a more conscious mm. way, then they're greenwashing. <laughs> I think that's, you know, right. I think it, it, if a brand has got a conscious line, but ultimately they're still plugging it at you and trying to get you to buy more of it and that conscious line is changing, every, it's mm. not a conscious mm. line. And, and, you know, and if, if a brand is giving you a tote bag um, saying, look, you can have a cotton tote bag, this is better for the environment, but you don't need a tote bag, mm -hmm. then it's not, you know, that is not being more environmentally responsible. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it's incredibly hard for brands as well to toe the right side of the line because it, people need things mm -hmm. and, you know, fantastic brands are supplying those needs, but they're doing so in a way which is not just mindlessly spewing product into people's houses that they don't need and I think you know any brand which is helping to co helping consumers to just question mm -hmm. do I need this yes I do is it good quality is it going to last you know and that's that's a good brand and that's a brand that's doing it right they don't need to do anything fancy it comes down to that basic are they helping me to consume less or consume more consciously in a more and, considered yeah, way in a more considered way um, and that's a brand that's doing things properly Victoria what do you think the questions are that people need to so I think consumers cannot underestimate the power they have collectively. I am, I am the consumer that asks a lot of questions before I make a purchase online because I have learned uh, that considered purchases give me more happiness and, 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 and more joy. Um, so it, in, for me, uh, it comes back to the link between greenwashing and transparency as we've discussed. This is if brands can't answer the simple basic questions about where the products are coming from um, and if there is anything that is unclear or not disclosed um, and you DM them, the power of DMs. I, I'm always in brands uh, questions asking because I really want to understand like where was it manufactured? Who made it? Mm. I think some of the smartest brands out there at the moment, um, like the brand that, that Jasmine's wearing, Seeker Designs, I love them. I can I know who's making that dress and it's so beautiful. And um, that gives me much more joy as a customer. So I think um, as a collective, customers have so much power. The questions uh, 
I think they probably feel they don't have time to ask questions, but actually it's so, it's, it's so questions. easy to ask as many yeah. questions as possible. And how brands respond to that, I think, is the most telling thing, right? Um, so, so, yeah. I don't know if anyone's read this really fantastic book by Dana Thomas, who's a New York Times writer called Fashionopolis, yeah. which is fantastic. And there's a great bit in it when she's just is so eye roly about um, the lack of transparency. Um, and she says, can you imagine that happening in any other industry? Can you imagine mm -hmm. buying a car that has faulty brakes and the car manufacturer saying, oh, I don't know where, the, <laughs> don't know where my brakes are made. You know, it's this sort of, sort of totally bewildering, yeah. you know, that that is the case. Um, Beth, how do you think customers can use, you know, we we're talking about this, this voice, you know, this power that consumers have. How do you think, um, how do you think they can use that power to, to ensure that, that they, that the um, brands do offer sustainable choices. Yeah, I think uh, I mean Victoria's given some amazing tips there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's 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 your money. It's being in control of that, and it's kind of ruthless information seeking. I guess one of the great things about you know the way we live now is that. Um, you can find information, you can ask for information and, you know, um, you can do your own research. And I would really encourage everybody to do that. Um, it's making the time as well, isn't yeah, it? Just stopping yeah. and really, you know. Absolutely. And then I think it is, you know, you have to build relationships of trust with brands and partnerships that you think are doing good in this space. Um, and, and, you know, again, looking to, to trusted brands who are willing to establish a dialogue. I think mm -hmm. with customers who are willing to talk about what they're getting right. Um, I think the thing with greenwashing is actually there's some very strict um, legislation that's recently come into force on this, which is welcome. Um, but I, you know, and I think often there's been a bit of naivety actually from from some retailers and brands in this space who think they're doing something good over here, mm -hmm. but are not necessarily realising the impact over there. Mm -hmm. Um, so the legislation and the education is, is, is it, it makes it clear it's helpful, um, but equally, you know, it's I think it's for brands to to find ways of establishing a dialogue with their customers and being brave enough to accept there are restrictions about what you you can and can't do, but also uh, being open about what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the that's the tricky line that brands and retailers have got to walk. Um, so yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex subject. Mm. OK. Well, sadly, we are almost at the end of our time. Um, before I go, though, I want to bring us back to what we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation, where we discussed you know, this really radical change that we need to implement to, 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 to get results and you know, try and create a truly sustainable fashion industry. What change would you all like to see in the in the next 12 months that you think would have the biggest impact? I think it's, um, it's just a education and awareness for everybody involved that um, the cycles that we live on of consumption and debt will never create the long lasting change that we want to see. And um, we have to understand that uh, consumption doesn't equal inner fulfillment. And I think people are starting to kind of understand that we're seeing mm -hmm. way too many images of and hearing too many stories about garments being burnt and the cost of that in other countries and to workers etc and I think it is going to start playing on our minds if it hasn't already mm -hmm. um, especially when big brands like her John Lewis are making alternatives available um, yeah understanding quality over quantity and then being part of the shift, being part of a citizenship based model where you are, you know, if we were tomorrow told that we had to pay money for every garment that we left our mm -hmm. house, we would soon be very involved mm -hmm. in what exactly we've taken on when we make a purchase. Mm -hmm. Charlotte, what would you like to see? It's hard to answer what I'd like to see in the next 12 months, but I think longer term, um, the thing that we see having the most impact mm -hmm. is, and, and obviously it's very particular to our business, but I think it, it, it it kind of echoes through society is mm -hmm. getting children involved makes an enormous mm -hmm. difference um, and helping them to understand how to live better mm -hmm. and and actually it's incredibly so powerful right. we and I, I mean my own daughter she doesn't ever question the fact that her clothes are going to somebody else because she's been doing it since she was two years old mm -hmm. and it, even her school uniform which is not going to someone else it's going to the cover for her sister she says well who's going to wear this shirt next mummy mm -hmm. and 
she, and, it, and it's just that acceptance it's ingrained, it's ingrained, ingrained, in, her it's ingrained in her without me having really had to do very much at all and I think if we can help the next generation that's to really just do that without questioning it that's the biggest thing that is going to create a shift because it, we've talked a lot about how this is habits and it's breaking habits mm. well if we never let them form those habits in the first place mm. then we won't have to break them in 10 years really, time really true Victoria so for me I guess immediate change and then you know thinking 12 months out um, if you have been on the fence about rental, now is the time to trial it. We are just about to hit party season. Why not rent an amazing <laughs> lemon Lyrica Matoshi dress for your Christmas party? It is That's so easy. <laughs> it is so easy to do and you will have that aha moment. And we know because I have all the data that once you rent once, you're going to rent many more times. So for me, now is the time when you hear about the launch of John Lewis Rental to really just give it a go. It's so easy. It's exactly like shopping. You just send it back at the end. The moment we can get you know many more customers doing that for the very first time we will start making real change as quickly as possible and party season is amongst us and there is no catch <laughs> and there is no catch <laughs> beth how do you see us create um, probably long lasting change yeah i think in two ways a, a little bit what um charlotte was nudging at so i love the idea of us being in a place where we're spreading confidence uh -huh. through um you know recycling rewearing and rental and that that's a real kind of um style statement as much as anything else so um, I'd love for us to be part of that movement where the pressure to consume and be part of a trend or a look that fast fashion I think has been synonymous with changes into something completely different and we really advocate you know um, uh -huh. rental and, and rewearing and the joy that comes with that and I guess look in 12 months time if even sort of five or ten percent of our annual sales in fashion were coming from rental we'd be in an incredible place mm -hmm. um, I'm way more ambitious than that but I think you know honestly um, that would you be a make huge shift change. yeah exactly so it's uh, it's exciting okay well I'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there but thank you everyone for just sharing so generously and um, freely with your thoughts and insights which really made me think a lot um, so thank you Charlotte Victoria Jasmine Beth um, there's so much we haven't talked about I mean it's such a vast topic but I hope today's discussion has just made us think and also you know, it's, it, it's so good it's just so good to keep talking about this because it's such an important conversation um, it is clear with collaboration and a collective intent we can come up with solutions that are better fairer greener more sustainable and we can hope to turn the dial from fashion conscious to conscious fashion <laughs>